Evening, everyone. Glad to see you. We appreciate your presence. As our custom is, we'll be opening up with a word of prayer, then we'll get started. Pray with me, please. Our God and our Father, we thank you for this day you have given to us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together here, that we can study your word. We pray, Father, we put it in our hearts. We ask our blessings upon all those that are sick. Pray that you would guide the hands of those who care for them. We ask, Father, that you be with us through this service, that we do everything in accordance with your will. In Christ's name we ask. We have started a study of the evangelistic epistle to Titus, and last week we got an introduction and overview of sorts, and hopefully we can keep some things in our minds. For example, probably the first thing to keep in the mind is that First and Second Timothy and Titus are better known as the evangelistic epistles. Some people call them the pastoral epistles. I believe that evangelistic epistles is better because we can establish that Timothy and Titus were both gospel preachers. There is no evidence that either one of them would have been an elder, a shepherd, an overseer, a pastor, as the New Testament uses the term. The second thing hopefully we have in our minds now is that the theme of Titus is conduct manual. And it is the conduct manual given to and addressed to evangelists. And hopefully we can remember there's three chapters to Titus, and the summary of chapter 1 would be sound conduct for or to the bishops, chapter 2 would be sound conduct for or to the brethren, and then chapter 3 would be the benefits of sound conduct. I thought about it, and I decided that this is what we're going to do every week. We're going to read the whole epistle to Titus out loud every week. So if someone would... Read all three chapters of Titus out loud for us at this time. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ after our Savior. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any man be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert the whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abom abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. But I speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged, be, the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and patience. The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as become holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, 
chast, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not, prolong, not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar, a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing the, of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will let thou affirm constantly, <coughs> that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable in vain. A man that is an, that is an heretic after the first and second ad, admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is, sub, is subverted and sin, being condemned of himself. When I shall send Armus, Armus, Artemis unto thee, or Tychus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenus the lawyer of and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. All right, good. That took about... A little bit more than six minutes. There's a whole book of the Bible. Now, last time we started verse number one of chapter one, and in Titus one, verses one to four, here we're seeing the address. This is the general opening that we see associated with Paul's letters. So notice with me Titus one and verse one. Paul, this is the person we, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus, a servant, that is, a willing bond servant, a slave to some extent, of God that gave honor and glory to God, and an apostle. An apostle was one sent forth with a message or commission of Jesus Christ. So Paul was sent forth or commissioned to give honor and glory to Jesus Christ according to, in harmony with, the faith. That is, if you look at Acts 6 and verse 7, many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So sometimes the faith means the gospel, the New Testament. According, in harmony with, the faith of God's elect. Now here's where we're going to pick up. Of God's elect. Now, the elect are those who choose to obey the predestined plan, which always entailed Jesus Christ, the church of Christ, and the gospel of Christ. We learn that from Ephesians 3, 8 to 12. The three key words in that section of Scripture are church, eternal purpose. Surely we've marked those through the years. Now, who are the elect? The elect are the saved, Acts 2, 21, 38. And the saved are the baptized, Acts 2, 41. 
and the baptized have been added by the Lord to the Lord's church, Acts 2.47. And the Lord's church is the body of whom? The body of Christ, Ephesians 1.22 and 23. And Christ is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5.23. And there is but how many bodies associated with keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? One body, Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. So according to the gospel of God's elect, the gospel that gives honor to the God's elect, that is Christians, members of the Lord's body, and the acknowledging of the truth. Now this seems to be the intended result of Paul's apostleship. That is, to influence sinners to become saints by recognizing the truth. What did Jesus say about the truth? In John 8, 31 and 32. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. How does the truth make us free? We're going to hear a sermon on truth Sunday, actually two of them, but it's one big sermon, just cut in half. You know, that works out pretty good, at least for the preacher. Think about it, James. Think about it. All right, the truth shall make you free. How? Is it just because we have a copy of the Bible? Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man what? He beholdeth his face in the glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgiveth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and... Continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So think about that. Okay, we have to be hearers and doers, James 1, 21 to 25, of the gospel, Ephesians 1, 13, and the gospel is the faith, Colossians 1, 23. That is the better covenant established upon better promises, Hebrews 8, 6. In other words, the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. So, and the acknowledging of the truth, what was Paul trying to get people to do? To acknowledge the truth of God's word just by them hearing it? No, but by them doing what they needed to do to have their sin problem resolved. What's the only thing that can wash away sins? The blood of Jesus Christ. Where do we meet the blood of Jesus Christ? When we're baptized into Jesus Christ. Now notice this. And the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. So the truth, the gospel, the faith, whatever you'd like to call it, is according to godliness. Well, what is godliness? Godliness is reverence and respect shown to God. So godliness deals with both attitude and actions, which place one into a right relationship with the true and living God. That was the purpose of Paul's life. He was a servant. He was an apostle. His goal in life was to help people get to heaven. Can you think of any better goal in life? Could you think of any better way to spend your time? Is there anything any better to do than ultimately help people realize their spiritual condition, let them see the truth of God's Word, and then encourage them to do what they've read and what they now know to be right? That's what Paul did. Notice verse 2. Paul sometimes wrote the longest sentences I've ever seen in my life. In hope of eternal life. What is that? This is a motivating factor for acknowledging the truth which is after godliness. And this is also how God's elect are supposed to live. How are we supposed to live? In hope of eternal life. What does that mean? What is hope? Is hope, according to the scriptures, wishful thinking? That's exactly what hope is. So hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is confident expectation of existing for how long? In hope of eternal life. What does that mean? So God's elect have confident expectation that we're going to live forever in heaven. You think that's a motivating factor in life? It, shouldn't it be? With every decision we make, is this going to help me get to heaven or is this going to hinder me from getting to heaven? In hope of eternal life. Now hope as a general rule is something in the future. Hope is something that sustains the faithful during periods of hardship. Have you had hardship in your life? 
Have you had difficulties in your life? Did you give up and quit? Why not? Because you had confident expectation that things were going to get better. And then, even from this perspective, if things don't get better on this side, they'll get better on the other side, won't they? Won't they? If we're in Christ and faithful. Now what about in hope of eternal life, which God, the true and living God, what about him? That cannot lie. So all the characteristics of God harmonize with the inherent nature of God. So some people say, could God make a rock so big you couldn't lift it? Could God make a square circle? God doesn't deal in absurdities. God doesn't deal in contradictions. God doesn't deal in anything sinful. Therefore, God, and it says God, so it probably references the Father, but this would also apply to Jesus and the Holy Spirit too, would never do anything contrary to his word. And his word, that is the Bible, states very plainly that God will not lie. That's not what it says. It says God cannot lie. Hebrews 6.18 Now, what this should be is an eye-opening, encouraging statement to the faithful. Don't you think? Has God promised eternal life? Yes. Are there conditions attached to inheriting eternal life? Yes. So what do we know when we satisfy the conditions attached to the promise? Can we know that we have eternal life and promise? Yes. If somebody doesn't believe that, just read 1 John 5 and verse 13. We can know based off the things that are written in God's word whether or not we have eternal life. So if I were to ask you, are you going to heaven? What should your answer be? It should not be, well, maybe. Well, I, you know, what day is it? Is it Wednesday? Yeah, probably I, I might make it on it. That's not how we're to be. We're to have confident expectation that God is going to keep His word. Are we walking in the light as God is in the light? Then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son does what? Cleanseth. It constantly cleanses us from all sin. Do you know that you're going to heaven? If not, why not? Do what you need to do to make it where you can know that I know that based off the truthfulness of God's word, because God cannot lie, that if I die today, I'm going to glory. Where are you going? You say, that's arrogant. Is it? Or is it confident expectation and accepting God at his word? Something to think about, isn't it? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and everything associated therewith, including the hope of eternal life, was planned and prepared before the foundation of the world. That's what Revelation 13, 8 says. It teaches that Christ is as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Was that literally true? No. But in the mind of God, it was a done deal. You ever stop to think about that? Now, what is eternal life? In hope, confident expectation of eternal life, living together with God, and there's no such thing as time and eternity, which God that cannot lie promised. So notice that eternal life is a promise, 1 John 2, 25. All faithful Christians can know that we have eternal life in promise, right? 1 John 5, 13, yet again. Now, in order to possess eternal life, one of two things has to happen. You know what the first one is? You're going to have to die. You can have eternal life in promise, but you want to go get it? You want to possess it? What's going to have to happen? You're going to have to walk through the doors of death. What's the one exception to death? The second coming of Christ. And if Christ comes back, guess what? That's it. Game over. Ready or not, here he is. And we're going to step into eternity with our naked souls and what we've done in this body. Are you ready? Do you know? Can you know? Why is the New Testament written? But to give us confidence, to let us know, hey man, we've obeyed the gospel. We're walking in the light. Life is okay. Even when the worst happens, we win. True. Promised before the world began. 
But notice verse 3, but. Now this is probably not so much of a contrast as it would mean moreover or in addition to. Many times but means a contrast. But here it probably means in addition to. But hath in due times, that is, on proper occasions or at set times, and God always does things right on time. Remember, in the fullness of the time, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Does that sound like the Scripture? It is. That's Galatians 4. Now what has God done? In addition to giving us the promise of eternal life before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. Let that statement seek in. Let that statement seek in. God has rendered apparent, that is manifested, his word by means of what? Through, God has manifested his word through what means? You know, God, is anything too hard for the Lord? God could have written in the sky, Jesus of Nazareth, is the only begotten Son of God. That's not how He chose to manifest His Word. How has God chosen to make plain, to render apparent His Word? Through preaching. That's what the text says. Now notice it says preaching. It doesn't say drama plays, does it? It doesn't say testimonials, does it? What does it say? It says preaching. Remember, to the law and to the testimony... If any speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in him. That's Old Testament, but it's still true in Isaiah 8 and verse 20. Preaching involves the proclamation of God's word with distinction and clarity in order to facilitate understanding. I think it was earlier this year we went through Nehemiah. Does anybody remember Nehemiah 8 and verse 8? They read from the word of God distinctly, didn't they? And they gave the sense... They gave the meaning. That's preaching. To take God's word, that's all we really have authority to preach, isn't it? Preach the word, 2 Timothy 4, 2. What word? The word of God. What does it mean to preach the word of God? To put it forth, to make it plain, to make it simple so that everybody goes, I got it. I understand. That doesn't mean I'm going to do it. But it means that, that that's what it says. And generally... What it says is what it means. Wouldn't you agree? Now notice this. But hath in due times manifested his word, God's word, through preaching, which is committed unto me. See that word committed? The idea is entrusted. I remember well sitting in school. And one of our instructors liked to ask time and time again, can God trust you with his word? Can God trust you to turn you loose with His Word? You may want to note 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4. Can God trust you with His Word? You know, the Word of God is precious to God. Think about this. Who do you entrust your children to? Would you just turn anybody loose with your children? Say, here, go with them. Would you just... Think about what's precious to you. Children, th think of something that's precious to you. Who do you turn loose with your car? You just say, hey, hold the keys. Think about it. Things that are precious to us. What is precious to God? Well, all people are precious to God. But can God trust you with His Word? You know, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. What happens when you get an untrained person a sword? That could be quite dangerous, couldn't it? Couldn't that, that could make a mess real quick, couldn't it? So that's something to think about, that what we're, what we're handling up here, we can be one of two ways. We can be like a maniac with a weapon, or we can be like a surgeon with a scalpel. Right? Who do you let cut on you? You want to turn me loose? There, Brock, give him a scalpel. He'll cut it off there. Don't, that's not going to happen. That's not, do you, do you understand the idea here? Who do we trust to do certain things or with certain things. Paul said by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the word of God which is committed unto me. For the conversion of Saul is recorded in Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. And Paul had become a chosen vessel 
to bear the Lord's name before Gentiles, before kings, and before the children of Israel, according to Acts 9, verses 15 and 16. What about you and what about me? And they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. That's in the book of Acts. That, that shows us the evangelistic fervor that had gotten in the bones, so to speak, of the Lord's people then at that time. What's happened? What's happened? You know, many, they say, and I don't, I don't ask. I don't go on a poll. But there's people that ask, and there's people that poll others. You know that most members of the Church of Christ have never converted one other soul to the truth. I don't even know how. I don't even know where to start. So stop and think, how many people have we actually made the attempt to say, look, man, I love you. The greatest thing I know in the world is Jesus. Here's the gospel. Let's just sit down and see what God's Word has to say about certain things. In reading these evangelistic epistles, even these opening verses of the opening chapter, there's a sense of excitement. There's a sense of exhilaration. There's something here that perhaps we overlook, which is committed unto me. The word of God through preaching had been committed, entrusted to Paul as an inspired apostle according to the commandment of God our Savior. So Paul's preaching of God's word, which is the truth or the gospel, was not optional for him, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Ever stop to think about that? Paul on at least one occasion said, Woe, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9 verses 16 to 17. Paul realized that God's word needs no additions, it needs no subtractions, it needs no modifications. It just needs to be preached. It needs to be proclaimed without fear or favor. They want to note what he wrote in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. How do you feel about preaching? And I'm not necessarily asking for an answer, but you can say whatever you want to say whenever you want to say it. How do you, how do you feel about that? You know, how, it's, it's interesting the way that people look at me when they figure out that I'm a preacher. I'm very, I, I really don't tell people that a whole lot. Do you know why? They look at me like, hmm, he's, you know, he's a cheapskate. Hmm, he's a, I'm none of those things. Never have been. He's not going, I know, I pay my bills with the Lord's help. I'm not trying to cheat anybody out of anything. But it's amazing at the way that people view preachers because they think you're a shyster. They think, sorry if you are, but you're like a used car salesman. You'll say anything just to pull the wool over people's eyes so that they'll give you what you want. That's not how gospel preachers are. Never have been. All we want to do is proclaim with simplicity and clarity the truth of God's word so that people can go to heaven. Don't you think that's what Paul did? Don't you think that he realized when he woke up, whatever day it was, what's the goal today? Let's help people get to heaven. How am I going to do that? However I can, in whatever capacity I can, I'm going to do my best to help people see the truth of God's word, to obey it from the heart and get right. Notice verse 4 to Titus. So this entire epistle, this entire letter is addressed to whom? All right. It says to Titus. What was Titus? It appears that Titus would have been a gospel preacher. But the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2. So even though this epistle is addressed to Titus, what was Titus supposed to turn around and do with this letter? Stick it in his back pocket and say, uh, you know, this is for me. No, Titus, you take this letter and you preach it. You preach it without fear. You preach it without favor. You make it plain. Do you see? Now what is the evangelist supposed to do? He's supposed to take the things that are written, the things that in principle have been entrusted to him, and do what? Help everybody see the unsearchable riches of Christ. How good it is to be a Christian. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Does that sound like a scripture? Is it? Where is it? It might be in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 6. 
to Titus, evangelist, gospel preacher. We'll talk more about pastors and elders and bishops when we get in this same context here directly. To Titus, mine own son. Now, as a general rule, this language would indicate we might try and literalize it and say, well, the Bible says that Titus was Paul's own son. Okay, there's a sense in which he was, but based off the evidence of Paul's life, it appears that Paul was either a widower or perhaps had never been married at all. So Paul probably had no literal sons. Okay, but he did have sons in a spiritual sense, didn't he? Because it says, to mine own son after the what? After the common faith. So when you generally read that language about Paul referencing someone as his son, that would probably indicate that Paul was involved in the conversion of Titus. You may want to note that language from 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 15 and 1 Timothy 1 and verse 2. Now, all right, at what point did Titus decide to obey the gospel? I, I can't answer that because there's really no, nowhere in the New Testament that would give us a, a definitive point or place where Titus became a Christian but there's little doubt, in fact, there's no doubt that Titus had become a Christian. Did he become a Christian after one of Paul's sermons? He could have. Was Paul the one who actually baptized him into Jesus Christ? He could have. Now, no matter what way we look at this, Paul using the language to Titus, mine own son, indicates a term of endearment. Who do you talk to like that? Come here, son. Let me talk to you for a while. You talk to anybody like that? Put your arm around somebody? Grab them by the head and pull them down a little bit? Come here. I don't know that people do that anymore. Of course we do. But <laughs> we're rough around the edges, I guess, a little bit. But those, those type, that type of language, those type of actions are really terms of endearment. They're not mean. They're not mean-spirited. They're not meant in hateful ways. So there are things very kind. So no matter how we look at it, Paul really, truly cared for Titus. And notice he says, my own son after. That's the same as according to in verse 1. So if something is according to, it's after. If something is after, it's according to. So it means in harmony with. My own son after. According to, in harmony with, the common. Notice that. The common faith. There is one faith according to Ephesians 4, 5, isn't there? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That indicates the unified plan we all know is the New Testament. Now let's think through this. Sometimes common has to do with things that are unholy. Sometimes common has to do with things that are profane. Doesn't it? But sometimes common references that which is prevalent that which is well known, that which was shared by multitudes of people all over the world. That tells you what the gospel was at the time. Mine own son after the prevalent, the common, the well known, the worldwide faith. So despite the proliferation of denominationalism, we believe that the common faith still survives and thrives all over the world. Are you part of the common faith? The only faith you can read about, really, with God's approval from the pages of the New Testament? If not, why not? Notice how Paul begins his salutations here. To Titus, mine own son, after, according to, in harmony with, the common faith, the one authorized religion of the New Testament, grace, mercy, and peace. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now this is a common greeting or a common salutation from the inspired hand of Paul with one minor variation. Who can spot it? There's a word used in the evangelistic epistles that Paul, as a general rule, doesn't use to the epistles he addressed to congregations. Can you find that word? Grace and peace. Grace and and peace until he writes to the preachers and he adds the word mercy. Grace, mercy, 
and peace. Don't you find that interesting? So in all three evangelistic epistles, Paul included the word mercy. And we'll note 1 Timothy 1-2, 2 Timothy 1-2, and right there it is in Titus 1-4. Mercy involves compassion. Mercy involves empathy. Mercy is us not getting what we've earned or deserved. Do you think that's a reminder to the preacher? To be what? Most preachers perhaps are gracious. Most preachers perhaps seek peace. But mercy, I'm telling you, sometimes we want to let everybody get what they've earned or deserved, haven't they? And that's the truth of it. Now, what's the reasoning behind it? I don't know. But why does Paul say to the church at Corinth, grace and peace? Grace, they say, was a common greeting or salutation for those from a Greek background. Peace was a common greeting or salutation from those of a Jewish background. Okay? So it could be sometimes, he, it, to whatever background you have, we're saying hello to you. Whether it's grace, whether it's peace, but in the evangelistic epistles, all three of them, First and Second Timothy and Titus, he adds the word mercy. Stop and think about that. Grace, mercy, and peace from who? God the Father. Anyone ever wonder why God is referred to as a father? You know, this, this can be difficult sometimes for people as they learn the Bible. Do you know why? Because not every earthly father is good. And so to them, the concept of a father would be what we know as a deadbeat dad. Somebody that's not present, somebody that doesn't care, somebody that's heavy-handed. The only thing that some dads do is scream at children and whip them. And so when they start wrapping their minds around the concept of God being a father, they think, well, if, if God is a father like my father, I won't do that. But the concept of God being the father implies several things, and all of them are very beautiful. What is the father supposed to do? What does that imply? It implies, number one, parenthood. God the Father. Parenthood. Are we aware that we are the offspring of God? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Acts 17, 29. God the Father, parenthood, but number two, power. The Father, God the Father, is the only being in either the material or spiritual worlds that is subject to no one. The Godhead worked out their order of authority in eternity. And the Father is supreme. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 27. Number three, what are fathers supposed to do but provide? So God the Father implies provision. Our Heavenly Father provides our needs, doesn't He? Isn't that what Jesus taught in Matthew 6, 25 to 34? So what, are, what can we see here with earthly fathers? Do we see that we're supposed to be there for our children, for our families? Do we see that we're supposed to exert righteous authority in our homes? Do we see that we're supposed to provide for our families? And then number four, protection. The Father keeps us from evil, Matthew 6, 13 and 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. How? As we walk in the light of the gospel. That's 1 John 1, 7. Are fathers supposed to protect their households? Are we supposed to help keep, and especially protect our families from spiritual harm? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Do we do that, fathers? Notice, from God the Father and the Lord, Master, Jesus, Savior, Christ, Messiah. What connects Lord and Christ but Jesus? He is our Master. He is Lord. His name is Jesus, and that means Savior, and He is Christ. That is the same as, that's equivalent with the Hebrew concept of the Messiah. So Jesus is our Master. He is our Savior. That's what Jesus means. And then it even tells us, our Savior and that idea brings, he's the one who has delivered us. He's delivered us from the power of darkness. We've been conveyed into the kingdom of this Jesus. Now what Colossians 1, 13, 13, 14 teaches. So in other words, think about this. Paul is writing the address here to Titus. And in principle, he's laid out some facts. But then he says, greetings from the Godhead. Well, where's the Holy Spirit mentioned? We would respond with, how would Paul have known anything if the Holy Spirit hadn't have inspired him to write it? So it's implied even in everything that he's written here. So think about this. 
grace, mercy, and peace originate and emanate from the Godhead. So if we really want to understand grace, we need to understand God. If we really want to understand mercy, we need to understand God. If we really want to understand peace, who are we going to have to understand? God. Anybody have any questions or anything you'd like to add about the address in Titus 1, 1 to 4? Good stuff. Many times how these epistles begin and end, we, we overlook that. But there's good stuff here. Now, in Titus 1, 5 to 9, here we're going to see the assignment. All right, we've seen the address, we've seen the greeting. Now let's get to it. Titus, what are you supposed to do? Notice Titus 1, beginning in verse 5. For this cause. Now Paul seems to have always had a purpose for doing the things that he did, especially those things that were in harmony with the will of God as revealed in the gospel. So we believe that it's, it's good advice to live life with intention and purpose. What is the purpose of life? We could probably all give some type of answer, but if tomorrow morning comes, are we going to do what we just said? Let's say, what's the purpose of life? This person says, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14. I'd say, okay, you're right. What's that going to look like tomorrow morning when you wake up? Next person, what's the purpose of life? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay, good, that's fine. What's that look like when you wake up tomorrow morning? What does that look like? Ask somebody over here, get, get real crazy. We'll go over here to this side. What's the purpose of life? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. All right, what's that look like when you wake up tomorrow? Right? We're, we, we can get really good at giving Scripture. But do we live that out when we're away from this building? Do we? Now what's the point? Live life with intention. Live life with purpose. I've long believed that those who are going to heaven know they're going there and they've got that as set as an intent or a goal every day of their life. There are no days off in being a child of God. Is there a faithful one? So what, what, if tomorrow comes, what is the intent tomorrow? To help us draw closer to God ourselves or perhaps draw others closer to God? Have you ever asked that question? My dad taught me a lesson years ago. And I think your dad taught it to you too, or somebody did. If you aim at nothing, you know what you'll hit? You'll hit nothing every time. So if we live life, say, ah, it's just another day and have no intention, no purpose, you know what you'll accomplish that day? Nothing. Especially with the things upon which we place intrinsic value. Do we value the church? Do we value heaven? Do we value the gospel? Are we living with intention and purpose regarding those things? Or just say, well, whatever. Okay, sirrah, sirrah, whatever may be, may be, right? Not going to cut it. Paul said, for this cause... Intention, purpose, left I thee in Crete. What is Crete? Crete is a large island in the Mediterranean Sea, south of the regions of Achaia, that would be Greece and Asia. Now in the Old Testament, the island of Crete seems to have been known as what? Here's a, here's a Bible quiz. Anybody got any idea what the island of Crete seems to have been known as in the Old Testament? Kaftor. Notice Amos 9 and verse 7. So... Paul says, for this cause, intention, purpose, left I thee in Crete, Titus has been left on this island in the Mediterranean Sea, a large island, that thou, now notice something here. This assignment was addressed to Titus specifically, but it's not necessary to conclude that Titus was to do what follows without any additional help, without any additional insight from the brethren at Crete. Now we might say this, Titus was perhaps to take the lead in setting things in order. Or perhaps we might say Titus was to be the, the impetus, he was to be the spark plug, so to speak, to get the process started and then stay involved with the brethren throughout the completion of this task. Now many times, we want to make this case, the Bible provides us with the facts. 
without providing us with all the minute details of how to accomplish the task or goal under consideration. So it boils down to two things. All right, what's the fact? Okay, here it's laid out. Now, how do we do this? Two questions. It's got to be lawful, and then we got to figure out, is it expedient? Is it right according to the Word of God? And then how do we go about accomplishing this task in the wisest way where we are with who we have today? Notice what Titus was supposed to do. That thou shouldest set in order. Now, Titus was, in a very real sense, to straighten further. That's the literal meaning. Or to arrange or perhaps to correct certain things among the Lord's people on the island of Crete in the first century. So what is part of the work of an evangelist? He's got to set things in order. Now, does that mean he's Johnny Law and he's the stop-all, end-all? We'd say no, that, that one man pastoral type rule that's foreign to the teaching of the new testament but is he to be the spark plug that helps come in and say look here's what the bible teaches here's what we need to do the bible answer to that is yeah and what was titus supposed to set in order what does the text say the things that's plural isn't it that are what Wanting or lacking. So you mean that even among the sanctified, among the saved, among the congregation of the Lord's people, there can still be some things that are wanting? There can still be some things that are lacking? Yes. Lord willing, when we come back next time, we'll see what some of the things that Titus needed to help with and, and what he was supposed to do and what he was supposed to proclaim with regard to those things. We'll talk about Lord willing next time probably going to take me the longest time to get through Titus 1, 1 to about 10, about 9. After verse 9, it will pick up the pace probably a little bit better, but we're going to, it'll, it'll take some time. Everybody all right? Bored to tears? All right. Yes. Anything else? All right. Let's bow. Our kind, merciful, gracious, and loving Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name and how great thou art. Father, we're so thankful unto thee for this day. We're thankful for life, health, and strength. We're thankful for every good gift and every perfect gift in our lives which we know has come from above from thee. Father, we thank thee for this general or for this epistle that has been addressed to Titus. We're thankful that we can read it and understand it alike. We're thankful that we have hope of eternal life, and that eternal life is located in Christ. And Father, help us to all constantly examine our lives to make certain that we're walking in the light as thou art in the light. Forgive us all as we meet thy conditions of pardon. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good evening, everyone. Good to see all of you here this afternoon. I only have two updates uh, this afternoon. Uh, Ron Stockton had another heart procedure done yesterday, and all is well, as could be expected. Uh, Ron and Ginger are thankful for all the cards and prayers. Uh, and secondly, Samantha Peters will have surgery on her sinuses sometime in June, and this should help with a lot of the headaches and the pain. So thankful, um, thankful for that, and thank you for everything you do. Um, so before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this afternoon thanking you for this opportunity to come here and to learn more about your word. Heavenly Father, as we delve into this book of Titus about the qualifications of these men and uh, the qualifications of a sound church, we ask that we are open-minded and open-hearted to what your scripture has to say. Heavenly Father, as Ron, Ron Stockton goes through this recovery, we ask that everything goes well for him, uh, as well as for Samantha Peters as she goes through the sinus uh, surgery. We ask that all goes well and that it would help with her headaches and her pain. Heavenly Father, we know that you're the great physician. Without you, nothing is possible. In your son's heaven name we pray. Amen. As we continue our study of the letters in the ABC to understand the characteristics of what it means to be a Christian, the letter tonight is the letter B. And if you were thinking that this particular invitation would have anything to do with the Beatitudes, you would have been right. But that is not the case. Um, had this invitation gone, had I originally planned it, that certainly would have been the word. It would have been the characteristic that we should have partaken in. However, Brock did a lesson a couple weeks ago, and he mentioned one particular word. And I've been thinking on this word for a long time and hoping that this day would come that I would be able to come up here and present this to you. This is a characteristic that we as Christians should all collectively have. And today's culture has put such a negative connotation on the term slave. And in some contexts, yes, that is absolutely the truth. However, context is key for understanding any situation. So the particular word that we're going to look at tonight is the word bondservant. So I looked it up just to see what it means. And a bondservant is a person who is bound by service without wages, a slave or a serf. Now, I found a different definition after scrolling for a little bit, and this one I think fits perfectly. And it says that in the Bible, a bondservant is someone who is owned by another person and does not have anything of their own. They wake up every day to do the will of their master above all else. Now, anyone who is a Christian or wants to be a Christian knows that you have to be buried in the watery grave of baptism to be purchased with that blood. Now, that blood was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that purchase, we belong to Christ. We are slaves and servants to Christ and Christ alone. Now, of course, over time, under normal circumstances, that debt could be eventually paid off with money or some sort of monetary gain in exchange for that person's freedom. Now, we were purchased with not money, not cattle, not land, or anything that has any monetary value. We were bought with blood the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now, we could never, ever hope and dream to repay that debt. If you remember the song, he paid a debt that he did not owe, and I owed a debt that I could not pay. As followers of Christ, we should not be, and we shouldn't be the only ones who assume this position of a bondservant. Romans 1.1 says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, uh, separated to the gospel of God. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered broad, greetings. Jude 1.1, 1, 1, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James to those who are called, sanctified by God, and the Father and is preserved in Jesus Christ, and of course, most importantly, Christ himself. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeliness of men, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Christ himself considered it so important that he too considered himself a bondservant. That means that we as his followers should put the utmost importance in doing the same thing. However, one cannot be considered a bondservant without first making the sacrifice of being baptized. 
Now, the way that you do that is, first, you have to hear the gospel. You have to hear the gospel preached from somebody, Romans 10, 17. Then, after hearing the gospel, you have to believe that gospel. You have to believe 100% of it, Hebrews eleven six. Then, after that, you must confess that the gospel is the one and true gospel that we have to follow, Acts 17, 30. Then, we have to repent of the sins that we have made and try to turn our lives around, Romans 10, 10. Then we must be baptized, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. But the journey doesn't just stop there. It continues until we die. Revelations 2.10, be faithful until death. If there's anything we can do, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing. So glad morning when this life is over. Oh, <laughs>